we're building a community which then helps people, you know, like myself, who came from underprivileged backgrounds and that could end up down the wrong path. I was brought up in a very racist area. Every Sunday, the National Front used to sort of walk past my house. One of these days, I'm going to get my bloody head kicked in. So I started doing Aikido. It showed me a new world, discipline, self-respect, respect for others, self-defense. Personally, I wanted to do something with my life where I'm giving something back. There's a lot of people like Niall out there who are professional athletes. You're having to self-fund absolutely everything. Bike Division helped massively. It just allows me to free up my time to focus on training, rest, recovery. You've got to think about other ways of making income, make a living, I need to provide for my family. I'm trying to build myself as a brand. Anyone can just swing and punch, but you need to think about what you're doing. Do things that people don't see. My name is Niall Brown. And I'm a professional boxer. It's a career now. It's important to have a good coach because they've been there, they've seen it, they've done it. I learned this a lot from Des, to be honest, and people that I've got around me. And that's helped me massively in life and also going into boxing. The intensity goes up. At the end of it, you've got a goal. If I don't go running, if I don't go strength conditioning, if I don't spar, I'm not going to get there. There's always a game plan on your opponent, but it's important to work on yourself. You're dedicated. Always aim to be the best it can be. Not just obviously fighter, but the best person all around. Niall, Des, welcome to an episode of the Game Changers podcast. Thank you for having so, us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Des, who are you? Could you give us a bit of an intro to yourself? Yeah, so um, I suppose serial entrepreneur, built, scaled, sold businesses, and now I'm an investor across four different business businesses. And how did you get into this industry in terms of your story so far? So we're specifically talking about uh, fight division. So I was thinking about this on the way in. So I got introduced to martial arts when I was 19. And um, the reason I was introduced to it was I was brought up in a very racist area. There was a lot of the National Front. And every Sunday, the National Front used to sort of walk past my house and I used to walk past them. And I thought, one of these days, I'm going to get my bloody head kicked in. And, um, and anyway, I thought, you know what, I need to be able to defend myself. So I started doing Aikido on a Friday night in the local sort of um, youth club. And, um, and it was great because on a Friday night, it sort of kept me off the streets and stuff as well and off the parks. But also it showed me a new world really of discipline, self-respect, respect for others and self-defense as well. I actually met my partner at Aikido and we've been together 21 years. So that sort of relationship started in that youth club on a Friday. So what attracted you to starting, you know, being involved in a business like Fight Division? So yeah, if I then sort of fast forward, so I was doing Aikido for a number of years, moved to Manchester sort of 15 years ago and um, stopped doing any martial arts. And then as I was setting up businesses and pivoting my businesses, as you'll know, you have some dark times and I needed something where I could like lose weight and also just to take me out of the daily stresses of, you know, starting, building, growing a business. And uh, one of my friends, Taz, uh, he used to train in Muay Thai in the Midlands. He'd also moved to Manchester. He says, why don't you one day come to Master Skens in Stockport? So this is going back, what, 10 years now. And uh, yeah, and I just started doing some of the classes. But yeah, but my main reason was to, um, you know, relieve some of the stress from the daily challenges of work. So I can relate to that. The, uh, I guess um, that time sort of spent where you, you, know, you concentrate solely on the, with that activity or exercise that you're doing, it takes you away from all the stresses. And, and often like you find yourself, oh, that's a great idea. I'll do that later. And uh, it can lead to a lot of clarity in terms of like, your actual working day. So what sets Fight Division apart from other people in the industry, if there are other people in the industry that operate like that? Yeah, so I suppose if I, if I sort of explain how, how Fight Division has come about, really. So we all started training at the same time. Um, now went on to become a world champion. I've barely improved. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, and I think, um, you know, sort of training with um, the guys at Master Skin, and Niall trains me as well. I've got a real insight in terms of the industry around combat sports. Niall switched over to professional boxing. And then we're basically in love with combat sports. There's five founders and Miles, who's the brainchild behind it. What he's identified is there's a lot of people like Niall out there 
who are professional athletes, but it's very hand to mouth because until you're picked up by one of the big promoters, you're having to self fund absolutely everything. Yep. And uh, Miles, who's around all the gyms and he's filming these fighters, and I think he just sees how hard they work. They put their life on the lines, and unless they're the one percent who make it, it's it's really really tough. So Miles was after a way where these fighters could monetize their social media following to drive some income to help them become full-time athletes. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, I see Niall every week and um, never really knew what Miles did, even though I've known him for like 10 years. And the conversation went, you know, Miles is looking into something, he's building something, you might be interested. Obviously, you know, we know you, you love this as well. And, you know, personally, I wanted to do something with my life because I've been relatively successful uh, where I'm giving something back, but actually giving something back where it actually means something and I'm connected to it. And uh, and it was, yeah, it was sort of come at a really good time for me as well. So, um, so yeah. And what does innovation or being a game changer mean to you? So I think if I look at like my various businesses, we're disruptive and we're coming up with new products and platforms and technology that other people haven't done. And I think sometimes it's not just the tech, it's also the culture that I've built in my businesses. It's the way that we train people, it's the office locations and being very different from my competitors. And, um, you know, Bloom is a really good example where I entered that sector six years ago up against people that have been at it for 25, 30 years, a hell of a lot bigger. And within six years, we're now bigger than all of those people combined. And I would say a lot of that is not just copying them, but coming up with our own ways um, of being different, disruptive, and innovation across technology, the culture, who we recruit, how we recruit people, how we train people, where they're based, the diversity of the people that we recruit, and our competitors are very, very different. So, yeah. Just picking up from a thread from another podcast that you featured in, the uh, where you mentioned the important, uh, importance of fitness mm. in, in a business. Do you think that fitness should be ingrained into the culture of an organisation? Yeah, I think, you know, across the country really, and obviously globally, I think it should be, it's not a priority. And actually, um, health is wealth, isn't it? And I think so many of us, you know, we sacrifice it because I'm too busy, I've got work on, you know, uh, we've got social media and Netflix and we just get absorbed and it hasn't become a priority for people. And, and yeah, for, for me personally, it's not just the physical benefits uh, and I'm getting a bit older now and I'm sort of thinking about my mobility and stuff as I get older. But mentally for me, the clarity it's given me after training um, and a lot of people turn to running or cycling. We were just talking about some of the training that you do. But for me, uh, Muay Thai is the only thing where I can't actually think of anything else as other sports and training that I do. I can switch off and start thinking about work things, which can be good because sometimes you can reflect on things. But Muay Thai, the two hours I have with Niall every week. I'm switched off. And also, because it's so technical and hard, you forget stuff. And then he's like, well, I showed you this 300 times and I've, <laughs> <laughs> and I've still forgotten it. So, uh, yeah, no, I think really critical, I would say. And I, I'm, a, yeah, I'm a big promoter within my organisations that, um, you know, keep your mind healthy by keeping your body healthy and, um, th- you know, lots of benefits. And it can be simple as, you know, even just getting 10,000 steps in a day. You know, I've got People I know that, you know, they're struggling to get a thousand steps a day and it's like, you know, there's no excuse, you know, you should, you should be getting out there and you'll be rewarded uh, mentally and physically. Yeah, we now have a steps challenge. Two people at work here are particularly competitive and uh, they're currently vying to get the most steps in November possible. Yeah, I'm nice. trailing behind. <laughs> <laughs> so, Niall, who are you and could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Niall Brown. Grew up in Stockport, Manchester and I'm a professional boxer. Before boxing, I was a Muay Thai fighter. And how did you get into Muay Thai? Nothing like drastic. Basically, just I was just out and about, messing about with my friends. Um, and I remember someone came up to us and said, oh, we're going Thai boxing to Master Skens if you fancy it. So obviously, first I was like, what? what is it? What's what's Thai boxing? So they explained, I went on looked on YouTube and I went the next day. And then ever since then, I've just been, I've just been into it. So for people that perhaps don't know the difference between sort of Muay Thai and the other martial arts that are out there, yeah. how does it differ from things like boxing? Yeah, so Muay Thai comes from uh, Thailand. So that's what, I, just for short, it's called Thai boxing. Um, so you've got two fists, two elbows, two knees and kicking. You can also clinch. But like my, my teacher, Master Skin, says it's the art of nine limbs because you always got to use your brain. And I think that was a massive part for me. Like anyone can just swing and punch and do what they're going, but you need to be able to think about what you're doing. And that's helped me massively in life and also going into boxing. 
And do you think that's what really sets you apart in the boxing is that Muay Thai experience that you've got? Yeah, yeah, I do. Especially the way Master Scan teaches me is very creative. Like you're not just doing the same thing. A lot of gyms do repetitive. It's not a bad thing. You, be, you become good at it. Obviously we do that as well, but there's that like creative flair to it where you can you can go different angles. You don't have to be stood in front of the same person. You can do this, you can do that. Do things that people don't see. And I think it's a massive advantage because if I'm practicing something you've never practiced, how are you going to defend it? You, know, yeah. you don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And are there any ways that things like technology or data help drive any of your training, the work that you do? More so now. At first, not really because I was just a bit oblivious to it. But yeah, more so like diet. Um, I noticed you got a whoop on there. I mean, yeah, Miles yeah. keeps telling me about his whoop and sleep and stuff like that. So yeah, it's more and more it's becoming, becoming part of it. Anyone that asks me about it, I just say it's... it's um, it's basically a way to say, I need to sleep more. I'm not sleeping enough. That's all it tells me. <laughs> I think it's an expensive subscription, this, just to tell me to go to bed <laughs> earlier. <laughs> but um, yeah, the the data it gives is is quite quite interesting. I um, I started getting into continuous glucose monitoring as well, just because I was curious about it. Because I um, I started to feel like really fatigued after like long periods of exercise. Like if I did a long ride, I was like three or four hours. Yeah, I start to feel like I go home and I just want to eat absolutely everything. I thought I'm probably under fueling. And um, yeah, like the continuous glucose monitoring, that's been pretty interesting. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, is, it is important. Like you said, I've been recently saying I've been for tests and stuff, getting blood tests, checking your vitamins, certain things like that before. And I would have, I would have never done it. But with people around me telling me the benefits of it. Um, yeah. Did you find that useful? Because I, I, I mean, me and someone else here were talking about this actually, about whether we should get some blood tests done and decide whether, you know, what, whether things we could, we could improve through diet, nutrition or like otherwise. Yeah, I think there is a benefit because if you don't know, you don't you don't know. It's worth investing, or how much it costs you're investing in yourself. Even if nothing comes back, at least you know. If yeah. something comes back, you know, and you can improve it. Yeah, definitely. So, Des, for those of us that don't know about your journey, could you give us a little bit of background? I know you mentioned previously in another podcast like Yale.com, where you were working and yeah. you developed into managing more the digital side after the sort of the there was a little bit of fatigue in the sort of traditional marketing element of Yale.com. Yeah, so I think you probably gathered some of this from the last podcast, but I had um, a different start and a difficult start in life where I was abused when I was a child, in and out of foster care, and uh, dropped really lucky when I was seven or eight, where um, the foster family that took took me on decided to adopt me and my two brothers. And back then, that was the sort of late 80s, and in an area which was, you know, I was the only person that looked like me in that area. And um, apparently at that time, no one had ever adopted, no white people had ever adopted an Asian family, uh, Asian boys or girls. And uh, yeah, they went through it, they pursued it. And um, that was like a, you know, a life changing moment really, because it gave me stability, um, you know, love a family and uh, a good, really good work ethic. So my parents are working class, um, council estate, brought the house on the council estate and um, you know dad worked in a concrete factory and 15 grand a year bringing up you know five children so th- us three and then they got two of their own children as well um school was really tough i sort of um struggled um suspended got on with the wrong people and um you know only just scraped through really with um two c's four d's and e and an f and i was never you know the, the sort of fam- the family was never encouraging a few further education none of no one in my family has ever been to university so that wasn't really an option but also I wasn't academic so that was never going to happen either so um, yeah so left school and uh, factory work stay bright windows door knocking um, warehouses and um, yeah and I suppose if I think if I reflect back on my life there's been you know a few lucky breaks and when I was, probably the time actually I started doing Aikido, so maybe that was, um, this is when it all started to come together. Um, I was working in a warehouse, picking and packing nail varnish, and that company had a big sales team. And um, the salespeople used to walk in through the warehouse every day with the suits on, and they'd walk up the stairs, and they'd have a separate office. And, uh, and my dream was just, you know, one day I wanna be able to wear a suit, I'd love to be working up there, what would I need to do? And I managed to convince um, the sort of head of sales, Sarah North, um, she was a chain smoker, so she'd always be walking through the warehouse and stood outside. I plucked up the courage to talk to her and say, look, you know, I know you don't normally take people from the warehouse into sales, 
but if an opportunity ever comes, would you consider me? And uh, she said, yeah, 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 of course I would. And I thought, you know what, she's just giving me a bit of uh, lip service. And an opportunity did come, the sort of lowest level within sales. And she offered me an interview. And uh, I remember, you know, I sort of took the day off work, annual leave, went out and brought my suit. And I had my moment of uh, walking through the warehouse with the suit on. And interesting, the people in the warehouse were just like really derogatory. And, you know, you're not going to get that job. You're sort of one of us. It's them and us. And weren't that encouraging at all. Um, and then Sarah interviewed me and, um, you know, I still don't know what I said really, but I think she could just see something in me and passion and just determination and somebody that really wanted to try and change their life. Uh, and she gave me the job. And I think um, I got my suit. I also got a company car, which nobody in my family had ever wore suits for work or had company cars. And, you know, I'm sort of like 19, 20 and, um, you know, I thought I'd hit the big time, really. It was uh, it was absolutely great. And I'm running around the country with my A to Zs. And I'm basically selling nail varnish to wholesalers all around the UK. I'm to pull over every five minutes because there's no sat-navs. Getting the A to Z out, trying to find... I never left my sort of local area before that. I've never had that pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and yeah, and I think... Because I was so grateful um, and the work ethic that my mum and dad had sort of demonstrated by bringing us up and how hard my dad worked in the factory. Um, I was just so driven, determined, and I didn't want to lose the job. So I just worked relentlessly. And uh, and within months, I was the highest performer, bearing in mind I got no experience in selling beauty products, so basic training. And uh, yeah, and it, and it just I just really took off and I was sort of hitting numbers that they never even seen in that business before. So, um, yeah, so from that, I um, saw an opportunity. I was looking for a new role because they were capping my commission and I wanted to, you know, move on again, really. And I was sort of high performer, targets going up, commission being capped, and I didn't feel as incentivized. So I thought, you know what, this is the right time to look for something else. And um, again, I don't know if you remember, there used to be a magazine called The Grocer. And, uh, and I'd flick through The Grocer and there'd be people advertising jobs. And uh, there was this big advert for Yell Group, Yellow Pages. And, you know, back then it was a, you know, FTSE 100 business, uh, biggest face-to-face -face sales force in the UK. And um, yeah, the entry level salary was like 36,000 a year. And we're going back, you know, 2004 and you could have any car that you wanted. And I just thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity, much bigger business, uncapped commission. And, um, you know, I should just go for it because this could then change my life again and, and move me on again. And um, similar thing happened really. So, you know, I went through uh, lots and lots of interviews because at that time they were sort of the Google of today and they could pick and choose whoever they wanted. And lots of people wanted to work for Yale because of the earning potential, the kudos, the credibility. And it was like, the, you know, the best of the best really. Um, and yeah, I kept getting knocked back saying, you're too young, you've got no commercial awareness, commercial acumen. Yes, you've sold nail varnish, you've got no media sales training. Um, and then one day um, I got an interview again and uh, it was a different person interviewing me alongside um, Diane Levitt, who was like the area manager. And then there was a local field sales manager. And the similar thing happened. He just saw something in me and they gave me the opportunity, lowest level, to go and work for Yellow Pages. And um, yeah, I was living in the Midlands and I had to drive up to North Wales every day, deal with first year advertisers and a lot of tradespeople who thought you were a bit of a necessary evil and turn up to meetings and you've driven like three or four hours up the motorway. So, uh, but yeah, it gave me, um, you know, I'd say discipline really, because it was tough. It was a really, really tough, you were paid well, but it was tough. It was really, really tough. and. Um, and had a great career, uh, partly I think because I went in and I was like really grateful for the job, but also I was like, shit, I'm out of my depth because everyone around me, all the other salespeople had worked for large businesses, other advertising companies, media businesses like Thompson's, Cordwell Group. I'm the youngest person they've ever taken on in that role. Um, and I'm surrounded by people who've got a lot of ego. And uh, during the training, I'm thinking, bloody hell, I'm, I've, I've like, <laughs> what have I done here? I took myself a bit of a hole. And uh, and I suppose, yeah, it was the fear of I didn't want to lose this job uh, because of the opportunity. And I wasn't going in there thinking I'll be able to do this um, with my eyes closed. I thought, you know what, I'm going to have to work really bloody hard. And I think that determination and work ethic led to 
I was promoted nearly every single year. So over a seven year period, I was the youngest person that ever taken on and the youngest person uh, at every rank as I progressed through sales, earning more than anyone else had ever earned. So it was, um, it was a phenomenal career and it was um, really good grounding for me as well. And then from there, um, I had a sort of desire dealing with other entrepreneurs. So when I was at Yale, I'm dealing with other business owners. And as I got promoted, uh, the businesses got bigger and they were more reliant on yellow pages and you were dealing with more professional organisations. And I just found, found myself asking questions, you know, how did you start your business? What were the challenges? Why did you do it? Has it changed your life? Would you be prefer to be in my position working for somebody? And um, I just couldn't stop. I just kept asking questions, absorbing, absorbing. And then I saw an opportunity where, you know, if you remember the yellow pages, I think you'll remember the yellow pages. Well, you've got, you <laughs> know, <laughs> used to be able to stand on them. Um, yeah, gone. Um, but yeah, the internet, the internet was, um, you know, revolutionising everything, wasn't it? And people were looking at Google to find businesses and yellow pages was in decline. And I thought, you know what, there's a shift happening here. Um, the landscape is completely changing. So I need to get a step ahead and be on the front foot. So I did a diploma in digital marketing while working full time. And I became, you know, a digital marketing specialist within Yell and also had the framework and the um, the education on how to put strategies together. So I thought, you know what? Yellow Pages in decline. I've got this diploma in digital marketing. The businesses that I'm seeing are saying that they want to do stuff on the internet. They want to advertise on the internet. They want websites. They didn't even have domain names back then. Uh, but they just didn't know what to do because all they'd ever had before was uh, Yellow Pages ads. So anyway, cut a long story short, um, I took a huge risk um, professionally, personally. Uh, bearing in mind, I was at a very high level for my age, earning a lot of money. And I left. I left and the company car went and the eight pound a day lunch allowance went and the box at Man United and the box at Arsenal. And I was on my own. And the first business I created was called My Marketing Aid, which was basically me as a marketing consultant, digital marketing consultant, going out to SMEs and helping them with website design development, SEO, PPC, the, di the digital marketing services that you'll be aware of. Um, and I was living in living in Manchester then, and it was it was difficult. It was really really difficult. Um, but first year, I ended up earning more than I was earning at Yale. Um, but I was trying to visualise how I'm going to scale this business. And actually, there's a lot of digital marketing agencies in Manchester, a lot bigger than me. They've been at it for a lot longer. Am I ever going to compete with those guys and try and win some of the big brands? Or do I need to identify a niche and maybe focus on a niche where I think they need my help? So I set up another business uh, in 2012 called MMA Digital, which was um, a full service digital marketing agency with a strap line that was online marketing for modern law firms. So I did my research and I thought, you know what, I'm going to hit the legal sector and I'm just going to focus on the legal sector because I think they need my help more than other sectors. All the digital marketing agencies don't want to deal with law firms because they take a long time to make a decision, the partnership structure. And in all honesty, it's not the sexiest sector, uh, sector in the world if you're in hospitality or food or fashion. So, um, so yeah, between 2012 and 2015, 16, I built a digital marketing agency. We worked with a third of the top 200 law firms in the UK um, and we became the market leader. But the market leader in that niche only scale to a million pound turnover. And my dreams and ambitions were much, much bigger. Um, so I set up another business and pivoted away from the digital marketing. And basically I set up a business that owns its own websites. I built some technology uh, to be different. And I started generating inquiries online using my skills. And I started then selling those leads to law firms instead of selling my time to build them a website. Um, and that business, um, the first couple of years were really tricky. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, the sort of the game changers, I suppose, referencing the, the podcast was I decided to qualify those inquiries instead of them being raw. And that led to more customers moving spend away from my competitors, existing customers spending more. And again, I was like, I need to keep growing this. I've got, you know, much bigger dreams and ambitions. How can I accelerate the growth? And uh, two, two and a half, three years ago, I decided that I wanted to attract investment because before that, I've always been a founder on my own. I've never had any external funding. I've bankrolled everything myself. 
I've sold cars, I've sold jewellery, I've taken out overdrafts. And um, this business I could see actually really had something, um, but I didn't have the capital to accelerate the growth, buy other businesses, um, take bigger risks, attract um, you know, a chief financial officer, a chief commercial officer who need big salaries and they need an opportunity. So I decided to uh, raise some money through private equity. And bearing in mind, you know, I sound how I sound, you know, about my education. When you're dealing with private equity, I'm completely out of my depth again. And these are very sophisticated financial engineers who have all been to Cambridge and Oxford. And they talk very differently to me. And at first I thought these guys are just running rings around me. And then you hear... Um, you know, the horror stories of private equity where it goes horribly wrong. Um, but anyway, I managed to um, convince a few people to put some offers in. I went with one of those businesses called Rock Paul and it allowed me to buy other businesses. So we then started making some acquisitions and it also allowed me to scale the business. So pre-deal, I got the business to about 30 people. Uh, now we're sort of 150 people. And having the financial resources and being private equity backed, um, it allowed me to attract and build out the management team, people around me so not everything's coming through me, and move offices. And we've got some really nice offices, invest in more training development for the staff. And uh, yeah, we, we, we really, really, really stepped up. And then uh, we were approached by a really big private equity house, one of the biggest in the world, called Sun Capital. Uh, they manage eight billion, so they're they're a, they're a big player. And uh, there was a strategic opportunity where they wanted to buy my business, Bloom. And uh, yeah, I sold I sold my business to Sun Capital. And what's happened since then in terms of like the PE deals? What's changed for you personally? Um, what's changed for me personally? Well, I think the first PE deal I'd gone from. Um, you know, really needed to train Muay Thai because I am HR, finance, marketing, sales, you know, the person that's like opening the office, closing the office, everything was coming through me. And the first PE deal allowed me to recruit people to fill those key positions. So, you know, if you think of the analogy, you know, who's on your bus, who are the right people on the bus and are they in the right seats? And that quite quickly, once those people bedded in, um, freed up my time. It really freed up my time because things that I would normally do, like, you know, the B2C marketing or logging into Salesforce or, you know, VAT return, wherever it might be, I didn't have to do that anymore. So all of a sudden I've got more time, but that time I could then think further ahead and more strategically opposed to, you know, the reality of running any small business is some days are really shit and you're firefighting and it's really hard. And you can't think about next year or the year after that or the year after that because you're dealing with the fires of today. Um, so that freed up my time, brought in some really good people, allowed me to think um, and be more strategic. Um, so that was great. Business scaled. We made an acquisition. And then the second PE deal, uh, that's allowed me to uh, now become an investor. So obviously, you know, if you have successful transactions, you, you create some wealth. That comes with its own challenges uh, when you've got a background like mine and it's sort of no one around me has ever done what I've done. And um, there's not many people around you that you can talk to when it comes to personal things around um, and wealth. And also having, you know, I'm, I'm sort of did my first deal when I was 39 and then, you know, having more time and then having the financial resources, but no one around you to enjoy it with is, 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 is can be can be really challenging, can be obviously really good as well. Uh, but yeah, I think I think the thing now um, is having having you know the time uh, while I'm while I'm young, still being involved in the business, doing what I want to do, and seeing that grow. And we're part of a much bigger organisation with a thousand people, circa hundred million turnover now. And I sit on the board. Um, I'm not on the tools. I'm not operational. So I enjoy being strategic, looking at M and A opportunities, advising the board, which is great. And then, yeah, personally, it's um, allowed me to create Dairy Family Investments, which is a family investment vehicle where I'm investing in things I'm really passionate about. So I've got a luxury travel and experiences business because um, I don't have children. I don't plan to have children. So I love my holidays. I love experiences. Um, and that was a really good opportunity with someone that's got a really good proven track record. Um, fight division. I was searching for something that hit the purpose. And it, it couldn't it couldn't have come at a better time, really. So I feel really grateful that actually, you know, it, it helps someone, you know, I'm close to. It helps other people who are probably from a similar background to me. 
Um, and also it's my skills around marketing. It's a social media led business with some great people that we've come together through the love of combat sports. Um, it's really exciting, really, really exciting. Yeah. And what do you think gives you the underlying passion for, for fighting division? Um, I think it's the people. Yeah, the people. I mean, Mars is absolutely fantastic. Obviously, I've known Nile for a long time as well. I see how hard he works. And um, and yeah, and, you know, the entrepreneur in me, you know what? We can be disruptive. This hasn't been done. We could be really ambition. Could we, ambitious. Could we one day be taking on the likes of DAZN? And um, yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's a startup and, and I've got a lot of experience in, you know, pre-revenue startup businesses and I've got plenty of white hair now and actually I can help Miles avoid some of the mistakes that I made because I learned the hard way over a 10, 15 year period. So um, yeah, I think I'm pretty useful now because like anything, I've got, I've got real life experience and I've got the scars and the wounds and all the rest of it. So hopefully I can help him navigate and help the business navigate some of the, um, you know, some of the, 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 the sort of wrong decisions really and uh, the mistakes. Yeah, I sometimes describe things like that, sort of like the queue skip, the level up, because you bring that sort of like knowledgeable person on board. You can say, well, actually, I've tried that. That might not work. You might want to try this instead. Don't do this because you're going to be banging your head against a brick wall. These things are going to be a challenge. And yeah, and I guess that's the that's what you bring to the table there. It's that, that massive wealth of experience and knowledge that you can bring to the team. So Niall, in terms of your Muay Thai journey, could you walk us through um, sort of like that competing and becoming number one and how that's all happened over the past few years? Yeah, so I go back again, like what I said, I just I just started, on a, on a, I can't remember what day it was, a random day my friends came up to me and said, should we go to Masters again and start Thai boxing? So I thought, yeah, let's give it a go. I remember there used to be a three-week trial, so obviously we all did the three-week trial. After about two days, none of them turned up to that. <laughs> I ended up going on my own. Um, and yeah, I just, I just stuck at it and just took a liking to it. So same for the first, it was just for fun, keep me busy. Yeah, and then competing wise, I think I was about probably only six months into training. And one of the lads, I didn't really know anyone there to be honest at that time. I was just doing in and out. We're supposed to be fighting, and Master Skin came up to me and said, "Would you like to fight?" And I was like, "Yeah, right." Like, maybe a bit naively, like, "Yeah, cool, yeah." Like if you think I can do it, yeah. So yeah, me and Glenn, one of the trainers, went down to um, Bradford. It was, and. Little did I know the guy was about 32, ripped, ripped up. <laughs> I, I was a, I've got a picture of all skinny. I think I was about 16, 17. And it was supposed to be like an uh, exhibition, you know, just to help them out so we didn't have to pull out the fight and stuff. So yeah, I ended up I ended up losing that fight. But it was just experience. And to be honest, I think not overthinking it made me just do it. Yep. And then from there on, I just I just enjoyed it. I was back in the gym on Monday and I think, Master scale, like I said, Glenn, the teacher, people just seen that I was, I was capable and I was, I was pretty good or capable of being good. And then just from there, really, I used to, used to do interclubs, which is like, it's friendly sparring basically, but it's a bit of an event. So other gyms will come to our gym, vice versa, we'll go to their gyms and um, just spar basically. But it's a bit of a crowd, so you get used to fighting, used to the crowd. Just took it from there, fight uh, once or twice a year. And then just built up. So you know, in those early days when when your friends decided they were they were dropping out and not coming back. Yeah. What was it that made you want to stick around and stay? I've been trying to think about it. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. It's just something that just maybe it was just something I was looking for, like a bit of a, a challenge. Um, I don't know. I've always felt like not in a weird way, but I'm different. Like I, I just it just it just attracted me to it, and it kept me uh, kept me straight. Yeah. And how have things changed now you've gone from being amateur to professional? I'm still enjoying it. It's still it's still fun, but there's a lot more to it when you become an adult. You've got to think about finances, you've got to think about your family. So more so that side, like it's a career now. It's not just for it is for fun, I still enjoy it, but it's a career. I need to make a make a living, I need to provide for my family. So that's pretty much the difference. So on a on a weekly basis, how does that sort of obviously making it a your professional career? Yeah. In terms of the obviously you've got the training, which I'm sure is a significant time investment. How much time do you have to put into actually making sure that you can make it sustainable every week? It's more like I learned this a lot from Des, to be honest, and people that I've got around me about relationships with people and trying to get sponsorships, trying to get people to help you out with sponsorships and stuff. So yeah, you do have to think about it. Like I said, the more the more I'm trying to build myself as a brand, build up. The people around me, fill up fight division. I do have to think about it more. 
as well as the training. And is that things like a like social media and like a paid engagement, sponsorships, etc.? Yeah, so social media, obviously visiting your sponsors, make sure you, you're doing what you, you said you would. So for example, say Fight Division, if they sponsored me, I've got to promote it in such a good way. And personally, I don't like to do things that I don't feel are good. Like, so someone could come up to me and say, do you want to be sponsored and you got to promote this drink? If I don't think it's a good drink, I'm not going to do it. I do what I believe in. So yeah, it is important. I suppose when you when you believe in it, you can have that passion and it just comes across yeah. a lot more authentic. Yeah. Like you said, it's authentic. It becomes easy to get. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in it. I want to I wanna help them. They want to help me. So it's a working relationship. So in terms of mindset and handling the sort of ups and downs and the preparation yeah how do you deal with sort of the the good days and the bad days you know when there's obviously i guess from a training perspective there probably is going to be the odd days but it's it's your job it's your it's your profession yeah how do you deal with that sort of like mindset going into a a fight or an event i feel like you just have to be dedicated and enjoy it mostly enjoy it because at the end of the day you've got to enjoy what you do but yeah then bad days where you think oh I'm tired, blah, blah, blah. You, you've got to stay disciplined um, because at the end of it, you've got a goal. I visualise what I want and I've got to get towards that goal. And if, if I don't go running, if I don't go strength conditioning, if I don't spar, I'm not going to get there and no one's going to do it for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that easy. No one's going to come here and hand me hand me what I want. I've got to go and get it. It's just that absolute focus and dedication to the goal, knowing that's what you're chasing. Yeah. I think you touched something really important there, which like I can like personally relate to is like the enjoying what you're doing is massive. Mm. And if you're not enjoying it, you're not gonna you are not gonna you you gotta although for you it's your profession, you've got a bit of that enjoyment there that's gonna keep give you that extra drive and that motivation. Yeah. Um because then if you're up against someone that isn't enjoying it, then that's gonna extend you at an advantage significantly. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got your ninth pro fight coming up on the sixteenth of December and you're now in camp. And what does that mean and how is camp different from day to day training? To be honest, the only difference is it, the intensity goes up and obviously you've got to get your weight down and focus on the one particular person that you're fighting. So like strat- strategies change and stuff like that. It's different for everyone. For me, I train all year round because like I said, I enjoy it. I'm disciplined. So that's the only difference for me. Some people have to come in and think about, right, I've got to lose so much weight. I've got to get back fit where I'm training all year round. I'm ready pretty much all year round. I need a few weeks to get ready. But yeah, in camp, it's just it's just focus, focus on the end goal, the big goal that you've got. So what would a typical day in training look like for you? Yeah, so we're in the gym in the morning, 10 o'clock. So we'll probably train for two to three hours. That can be sparring, it can be bag work, it can be technique work, footwork drills, all different aspects of what you feel like you need to work on and your coach. Because I feel like it's important to have a good coach because they've been there, they've seen it, they've, they've done it, they can... Similar to what Des was saying about before, he's he's got the experience. They've got the experience in that field, so I'd be stupid not to listen and work on what they work on. Obviously, you go home, have your dinner, you sleep if you're that tired. <laughs> um, but that's the luxury of having sponsors. Like you've you've got that. I've got that luxury now where I can go home and have a quick nap before I go to my second session. Before and I didn't have that, but um, with the support of sponsors, it it allows me not to. And then training in the evening consists of strength and conditioning, uh, running, sprint work, all different types of training again. So it's super varied then. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's, it's similar, but it's different days, uh, different things. And you mentioned obviously that the, how things were sort of different prior to, to becoming professional. Yeah. And stuff like, that, stuff like that, other commitments that you had. Uh, now there's other commitments out of the way, like how has that affected your like performance and how has it enabled you to to be the best of you, at your game? It's helped massively. Like I can just focus on what I need to focus on. I need I need to get to this goal. So not worrying about, oh, I'm tired. I've got to go and do a private lesson or I've got to go to work and stack shelves. It just allows me to free up my time to focus on training, rest, recovery, training. Like I said, um, Recovery is important, so especially for an athlete, when you're training two, three times a day, I need the rest to, to be at my best. Absolutely. How do you balance your personal life with the demands of uh, your professional life as a as a boxer? Um, it's all one. <laughs> it's not really much of a balance, to be fair. Is if you if you know me, you know what I'm like, and people accept me for that. The people who 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 are around me and what be around me, they accept me for that. So the balance is not very. Balanced. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think there's such a thing as like balance. I think they just become in, entwined together. Yeah. 
So it's like, um, like talking to my wife, like, like when we're working and we're going on holiday, and I'm sort of like still always working, like it's always me. Yeah. And I guess like for you, that's just the same thing. It becomes just part of your life. It's who you are. It's your DNA. Yeah. And um, and that's how, you know, you stand out and it, it becomes like you say, you enjoy it all the time and it's gives you that time to focus. So what advice would you give sort of a young athletes or individuals who want to turn professional? Probably more so in the last couple of years, I've realised the importance of like a brand and building something for the longevity. Because at the beginning, like I said, I was just turning up to training and having fun. But when you get a bit older, you get more responsibilities. You've got a, got bills to pay. So you've got to think about other ways of making income. By doing what you're doing, like I said, sponsorship deals, thinking about your time after boxing. Um, obviously, don't get distracted. Think, do your best you can at the time. But just just think about your, your brand a bit more. Like What's going to make you different to the next guy? Why are people going to want to work with me? And be the best you can be. If you're the best, people are going to want to work with you. So obviously don't get distracted from your training. And uh, what sort of things have you done to help you stand out from a branding perspective? I'd say getting the right people around me to advise me. So like getting involved in fight division. Like I said, it does miles. It's a massive, um, it's like a passion project. Like a lot of this has come from me and Miles training. Miles, by the way, is the founder of fight division training for like the last 10 years when he's at work and he's got to come straight to work to come train, help me get rid of my fight. And he, he's seen the struggle like I'm training I'm training people all day and I've got to train myself and he's thinking, why, why are you tired? And I'm telling him what I've done through the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, I've been put, holding yeah. the pads, I've been beating yeah, yeah. people all yeah. day. And he's seen that and I've obviously thought, there's something there that, that can help these fighters. I was watching some of your socials before uh, before this. Does Miles, Miles, Miles and the team help you the social or do you? Yeah, yeah, he has done and he's, to be fair, he's taught me as well, so I don't have to take all his time away like <laughs> I used to. Um, yeah, I was, wa- I was watching the reel with uh, like Killers in the Jungle. Yeah. That was really good. Yeah. yeah. Some good ones on there. Yeah, there is some really good ones. Like I said, he's he's done them and showed me him how to like edit things quickly and if I need to do it. So he's been a massive, massive help and a massive, massive like a role in my life. And how's how's martial arts? You know, be, given that you've been involved in younger age, how's it how's it changed in the past few years? For me personally, or just in general, like in general, like would you say it's become like more accessible, more wider known? Like how's obviously there's been some perfect people, and I know it's there's different disciplines, but how how's that change getting different people into the sport? Yeah, I think not many people like purists in the lightest book like the YouTube boxing. Like purists are going to say it's not proper boxing, but it's got kids involved that would have never done it even if they go to the gym once a week it's keeping them away from doing whatever they'd be doing so I think that's a good thing and it's changed it's more accessible like you said it's pretty much a gym in every every town every city now so yeah there's no really no excuse really if you want to get involved just come give it a go and who inspires and pushes you on a day-to-day basis probably my family master skin the people around me there's miles I'm not just saying it because he's here, by the way. Yeah, Pat, <laughs> yeah. The, the other fighters as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's really that network of people. Yeah, it's mm. it's really important. Yeah, people around me that that have been there, have done it. They give me advice. They want they want well for me. Um, so it inspires me to 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 do well. And do you have any um, well, what are your sort of goals and aspirations for your career? And where would you where do you, when you visualize the future? What do you what do you aspire to to work towards? I've been asked this before and I just always aim to be the best I can be. Yeah. Um, and what comes with that, I feel like a lot can come with that because me being the best I can be can be a world champion. There's no reason why I can't be. But I always focus on, on myself and just being the best I can be, and being the best best person, not just obviously fighter, but just best person all around. Absolutely. So fight division, I don't know who's best answering these. I've got a few fight division questions. But what is fight division? Me or you? You go. Yeah, so what I was saying, like, I touched on it briefly, like, it's, it's a platform basically to help fighters monetize the the social media, what they've got, and the support that they've got around them. Because like I said, you've got to work, you've got to fight. If, if, if it allows fighters to not have to work as much so they can fully focus on the career, then I feel like it's a great thing because for me in the last couple of years, that's what's helped me. I think that's what's pushed me because... I've been able to focus on what I need to do. 
And how is fight division different from anything else that's in the market? It's something you can do. You can you can help yourself with. Like we're giving you a platform. Now it's up to you. You can you can get help yourself. Like build a career off it. There's nothing. There's nothing like it really. So if you were an aspiring athlete, how does the platform work to support you? Yeah. So you you'll obviously get the app. You sign up, register all your details, and then you get a link to share. So you can share it to your friends, your family, on your social media. And just explain, just put your story, explain about your um, circumstances and then people can help donate towards your training, your, your living costs, your food prep and just help provide these people because I feel like there's a lot of people around that want to help. Like they, see, they see the graft that you're putting. For example, for me, people see me running out on the estate, they see me running in the rain, they see me the beeping, everyone's yeah, waving. Yeah. And some of the people, they buy tickets off me and they don't even turn up to the fight just because whatever for is the busy but they're happy to to support me because they see the dedication they see the time the effort that I put in so I feel like with this app it's the same sort of thing people people want to help if you if you're trying yep and um can you elaborate on the mission to create a thriving fight economy and how does that benefit fighters gyms and fans might be more you that yeah yeah so um the sort of purpose of fight division it's come from helping people like Niall become full-time athletes because as as he's been describing you know these people have got multiple jobs there's no income until you make it and not many people make it yet they've got the talent and they've got the dedication and determination but the, what we see is the vision really is fighters produce their content and they get monthly subscriptions off fans the fans in exchange get good quality content and get really wedded to that fighter and sometimes it can be really personal relationships like people that live near Nile on the estate the other thing that we're building is a community a donation project which is basically for gyms um, that are run down there's no investment there's no funding where a percentage of everything that we generate will put into local gyms which then helps people you know like myself came from underprivileged backgrounds get into something at an early age like Niall did and it can completely change the direction of their lives so in terms of giving back the fighters they can become full-time and the gyms all around the country and hopefully we can take this globally have an opportunity to raise funding to keep the gyms open and to invest to make them available for, you know, lots of children that, you know, could end up down the wrong path, could end up down the wrong path. Yeah, and I imagine now is a very sort of poignant, sort of important time with that with the rise in the cost of living, because we've got, you know, rising electrical bills that'll be impacting a number of gyms, you know, then that, that's not being invested into people or the equipment that could be there, and then they're having to close at certain times to facilitate all that So. I can understand how important that would be at the moment. And there's, sure. no, there's no funding available. There is actually like no funding. A lot of these businesses are, you know, micro businesses, self-funded. It's very hand to mouth. And um, yeah, and as, as you say, the cost of everything's gone up and then expecting students to pay more when it's, t you know, more difficult for them. People are training. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite critical. They need the support and they play such a big part in the community and not everyone sees it, but actually some really good examples like Niall you know, where could he have ended up? You know, you just don't know, do you? So, um, you know, I think it's I think it's really important, yeah. So you mentioned around the idea of building a community around combat sports as a sort of key goal of fight division. How are you guys building and developing this? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's actually five of us involved and um, Miles, who's the main founder, in fact, it all links back to training at Master Scans because we've got a chief technology officer who does work for uh, MOD and he, we met him through Master Skens training as well. And obviously when Miles said to him, look, I've got this vision of building something to help up and coming fighters from underprivileged backgrounds and help gyms like Master Skens. Um, he was like, well, of course I want to get involved because he's got a love of combat sports. So yeah, he's been building it with a team of people. And yeah, there's a real clever tech stack behind it all as well. So uh, we've been really fortunate that our collective skills it just um, are very complementary. And we've seemed to have like, just by chance filled all the gaps really we've got someone who's a professional fighter we've got you know miles who's got all the marketing media and he goes around all the gyms you've got sam snoop who's the um the tech guy who's the cto we've got lucy who does a lot of the interviews for last bastion if you've seen that channel it's got over seven thousand followers and she gets to meet a lot of the high profile fighters and she loves producing the content and obviously you know i've got me who loves training 
uh, know, know the individuals involved well and um, and also yeah I've built and scaled businesses so I've got the um, the commercial experience to hopefully uh, make sure it's self-sufficient uh, sustainable and grows. Niall how did you know something like that like fight division was needed before it was born? Because I've been there and done it I feel like <laughs> um, I've been there where like I said again I've got to work got to train got to work got to train got to try and rest in between and it's a lot first it's a lot to do when you're trying to focus just on one thing which is be the best you can in the ring and it's quite important that you've got the time to train properly because um it, it can be dangerous um if you're not training properly I feel like you need you need the time to train focus on what you want to do and if you want to be the best at it you do need that time so that's why I think it's it's needed and people will be very grateful of it and how does Fight Division help you to enhance the connection between your your fans and yourself? So just the content, there'll be a little bit more different content. Be able to see different things, what I'm posting. I can pretty much post what I want. I can show people stuff what I wouldn't do. So maybe something a bit more personal. I was going to say, is it almost like a little bit of like a behind the scenes type? But so you get a bit more close access to... Yeah, yeah. So I can show them, like I said, a day in the life of what I'm doing, what I go through. I can maybe put a podcast up there where I'm talking about what it's like to be a fighter. Just things that everyone's going to have ex- access to. Yeah, that sounds a bit like my sort of YouTube search issue, like a day in the life. <laughs> I'm always watching these day in the life videos. We're also, it, um, sorry. No, no, no so we're building the uh, the functionality where there'll be pay-per-view. So actually, if you are following someone like Niall and um, you're engaging in the content and he is fighting and you can't physically make it, then there will be pay-per-view functionality. And we're also building in the ability to buy merchandise as well, because obviously, you know, Niall's a brand in his own right, and to be able to buy the clothing with either Fight Division branding or Niall Brown branding as well. So you can, again, just get closer and closer to that athlete. Yeah, and I can see why something like that would be needed, because in the modern sort of era of technology, there's not really like a, a simplified, easy PPV platform to bring that engagement closer to fans. Yeah. Um, and the same for merchandise, like there's no one consolidated way to to do that. And yeah, I can see how that would be a major benefit for sure. Yeah. So is clothing something you've been, have you done much work on clothing and merchandise yet? Is yeah. It, yeah. I've, we've got the fighting as you're having the gear. I think, I think I've actually got my own one on. Oh, there you go. That is nice. <laughs> yeah, I've really? got my own one on. And do, um, you, do you work with it? Is that something you design yourself or do you work same, with Same, it's through Last Bastion and Fight Division. Same sort of thing, like, even if it sounds daft, it is selling t-shirts helps me out. Like if I could make a few quid on selling t-shirts, and I've sold quite a few because same again, people want to support me. They think, oh, that's that's cool. Like I, I like now when I go to his fight, I'll put his t-shirt on. Yeah, and the good um, quality. I mean, yeah, the yeah, really good quality. Yeah. yeah, we've gone for good quality products. It's like being part of that community, and yeah, um, but yeah the artwork looks pretty sick. Yeah, that's <laughs> for fighters considering fight division. What sort of advice would you have for them? Be open minded and just give it a go because you never know. It's like anything. If you don't if you don't give it a shot, you don't know the opportunities what can come for it. Like you could be making an extra few hundred quid a month, you could make an extra few thousand pounds a month so you don't have to, like I said, work. You can focus fully on your training. So I feel like the opportunity is there. Take it and give it a go. And what sort of things do fighters need to do to maximise their presence on the platform and make, make the most of the opportunities that it delivers? There will be work that you need to put in. Like I said, you may be getting your own content, a bit of videos, but for what it's worth, it is, it's, it, it's going to free up your time to train. So I feel like it's really worth doing if you want to take it serious then i think people who want to take it serious will jump on the platform and do what's necessary and just to sort of add to that as well is you know these up and coming fighters at the moment don't have this as an opportunity to generate income and it's brand new where they've got something that they're in control of 24 7 that gives them a new route to generate money so as you say to become full-time so it's um you know that didn't exist before it was you've got to work and you've got to then, you know, try and find other ways to subsidise becoming full time. So this is, a, you know, a new revenue opportunity, income opportunity to hopefully make it a bit easier for them as well. So, but yeah, there is a balance. It's then an investment in their time as well to get to get it to work for them. So previously with some of the sort of more well-known names out there, is it very much like um, almost like hundreds apply and like the one percent sort of get selected for that? Is it how were people traditionally discovered or, you know, funded prior to things like Fight Division? Explain that. Ask it again, please. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get is there. So there, was it almost like hundreds apply, but only like, you know, if a hundred people applied, only one would get selected. And how were they, how were they getting picked up? And how perhaps does Fight Division open that up to, so that 
more people can be discovered in a sort of ever growing sport. Yeah. Um, do you want me to answer? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, what I've seen, you know, having to seen how hard Nile works and how difficult the industry is, you've got someone who's super talented and the next fight would be 10th fight, 10 wins. But sometimes some of the people who have made it and been picked up, it can be down to the connections and the family and if the family had previously been in boxing. So sometimes I don't think it is purely fair. And I can think of, you know, an example like, you know, Prince Nassim's son. He's already, his first ever professional fight, he's fighting under the, he fought under uh, Usyk. And, you know, where's the years and years and years worth of graft to even get any kind of opportunity to fight on an undercard? So I think it, it creates fairness because it gives a platform where lots more people can see, they can share it through social media. And and more opportunity to be seen by the promoters. And you're right, you know, for every 100 people, you're going to get one. And sometimes that one person might be because their dad was a professional fighter and they can just, um, you know, accelerate the um, the ability to fight on the big fights without having to put all the hard, hard hours and fights in and all the labour over a number of years. So hopefully it makes it a bit fairer and uh, for some of those people that haven't got you know the, the big name behind them or the family connection so des from a mindset perspective i'm sure this is applied to you and business but how's how have you translated that mindset for for um sort of competitive sports into business it's a really good question actually so bizarrely muay thai i think is very relatable to business because you are thinking of strategy tactics and Master Skin always used to say, you know, the ability to change direction, attack, defend, and actually business day to day, it's exactly the same. You know, you're looking at strategies, tactics, sometimes you're attacking, sometimes you're defending, sometimes you're sidestepping out the way. And I found it really, really relatable. It was um, transferable, really transferable. And me and Niall, you know, when we, when we train, we talk about like business training. And, you know, I talked to Niall about, you know, when you're going into that ring and you've got all those people there, what are you seeing and how are the lights not dazzling you and what are you visualising? And he talks about his experience there and I'm like, well, I do that with work because I've seen, you know, I want to be picking up that award for my business or, you know, I want to be getting this private equity transaction over the line. What would that look like? What would it do? And yeah, it has so many similarities. It does actually cross over. But yeah, I think um, Muay Thai in particular, um, it's really technical. And as I said, there's a lot of strategies involved. And um, yeah, even the books that Master Skin used to recommend, like The Art of War with Shen Shu, and you know, they are used by business people as well as people in um, combat sports. So uh, yeah, there's the, for me, I think there's a hell of a lot of crossover. So you mentioned visualization. How important is visualization to you both in terms of you know, your, both pro- your professional challenges? I'll go first. It really does help. Like it sounds to some people, they might think what you're talking about, but it really does. It really does help. It makes sense. I mean, you visualize yourself somewhere, and you end up getting there. I feel like, as Des said, we've talked about it. Like when I'm getting got a fight, I'm visualizing right. I'm going to walk to the ring. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to think about what I'm going to do after the fight. So it it all it all does tie in because it's like you're giving yourself a little reminder of what what you're going to do when you get there, how it's going to feel when you get there, what you're going to do after it feels like once you've been there. So yeah, for me, it's it's massive. Yeah, for me, I think it's always helped me through the dark times because those days and weeks that you, you're waking up and you're having challenges with business, wherever it might be, it's seeing what you're doing it for. And it's helped pull me through because it's just created like a bit of an unstoppable force, really. And I've sort of always had the ability and felt quite fortunate that I've been able to see things and... I've made them happen. And I think part of that is, um, you know, those days when you want to give up and, you know, when you're in the ring and you've been knocked down, you've got to get up again. It's because you're doing it for this vision and every day. And I have, you know, a vision board. I have reminders and references on my phone with screensavers. And yeah, it's it's the drive I think it can create. And, um, and somebody was saying to me, actually, the PT that I've got for strength and conditioning training, Arnold Schwarzenegger has just released a book through Spotify, apparently you can now through Spotify, um, a bit like Audible, they've released um, audio books. And the first episode, Arnold Schwarzenegger, bear in mind all the different things he's done in different careers. He talks about visualisation. 
Arnold Schwarzenegger and you think he's what? Bodybuilder, film star, property owner, mayor, wherever he was, seen as in politics. Um, yeah, and it's, it's always about having the, the ability to visualise it. And then he's made it happen in certain things that you would never have imagined that he'd be able to potentially do. So Weird timing. I just started watching the uh, Netflix documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger. No way. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and he, uh, so he actually, I think like, Maybe his old house is like now a museum or something, but um, he has uh, he has these pictures on the wall, and um, he said I used to lie there and I would just look at these pictures, these like great physiques, all these people that he aspired to be like. You know, one day I'm going to be like them, and I think he actually, I've not finished it, but I think he, at one point he managed to train with like his idol. He's like, I'm out here training with this guy that I've I've looked up to for years as a, as like growing up, and then he finds himself with him and competing with him against like maybe like Mister Olympia or whatever it was he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was uh, it was crazy. Seven times Mr. Olympia or something, wasn't it? Yeah, it was yeah cause he, a, I believe he's quite interesting character. I'm not. I'm only on episode one of that series, but yeah, I think there's a lot more to. He's a very successful entrepreneur. He brought a lot of uh, real estate and he's invested in a lot of business. But again, you what you don't think of that, you think he's you know bodybuilder, film star, but actually, yeah. he's uh, yeah, he's got a lot of businesses as well. So one thing I'm curious about is when you so when you step into the ring for the for the fight, is there a do you go in with almost like a bit of a game plan, or are you just like you've You've put the work in. You, you've got. You've done the effort. You know that you're prepared for whatever uh, happens at the fight. Or do you go in with a sort of like, this is the tactic. This is what we're going to try and achieve. How does it work? Yeah. So there always is a game plan um, on your opponent, but things can happen. Your opponent can change at the last minute. So I feel like it's important to work on yourself and always, always be prepared. Just prepare the best you can for yourself. But yeah, there is usually a game plan. And is that sort of like you know someone that doesn't know a huge amount like me? What um what does that game plan consist of? Is it like is that when it comes to professional boxing, is it that you you study your opponent? You know, like there's certain things that they do. Like how does that work from a really high level? Yeah. So you you first of all you'd watch your opponent and you you see what they're good at, what they're not so good at, where you think you could take take opportunities. I think it's important to look at both. You can't just look at right. He's not good at this. You've got to look at what he is good at, so you can work on how to defend it or how to take it away it's a bit of everything you, you just have to prepare the best you can be final question now which uh, we get from our last guest um, so we've been finishing off uh, every single podcast with a question from the previous guest so this is from such a min um, oh he's not been in here has he am I sat in his chair but I can't stand <laughs> he's, a, he's a friend of mine yeah people associate sport with natural talent but how much does mindset and personal drive contribute to a sports person's success the talent doesn't really matter because if the person <laughs> doesn't want to do it or can't be bothered, then then the talent's pretty useless. So I think the mindset and the willingness is is massive. Yeah. That's what they say is uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yeah, exactly. If someone can't be bothered doing it, then it's not good, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also, I suppose, if you are talented, you get complacent because you just think, actually, I don't need to train as hard. You know, I've, I've got the natural ability and you can get caught off guard, literally. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, it can uh, have some negative behaviour, can't it? If you think uh, you're untouchable because of your raw talents and someone else is having to train that much harder, aren't they? What personal qualities do you believe are essential for someone to truly change the game in their field? I think you, you need to have resilience because um, the ability to pick yourself up, brush yourself down and go again and not give up. Um, so I think resilience. Um, for me, if I think about people I bring into my business, I don't recruit. Obviously certain roles, they need to have certain qualifications. But as a rule, I always recruit on attitude. And for me, um, you know, even people like Niall, there's a lot of professional boxers that have the wrong attitude and you know for me he's got the right attitude and people that I bring in so I think yeah resilience and attitude um yeah your turn now so um considering the theme of the podcast game changers what would you like to ask our next guest do you want to buy a ticket for the next fight <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a good one yeah, yeah. <laughs>